it, it started. Uh, this is not. This is a Zoom, a live Zoom. I mean, my address. It's a undisclosed location. Well, it's not really that, but undisclosed time. It, on the Friday, remember Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We'll always do it from four to five, and anybody can join. Uh, usually, I get my my four or five that virtual kids that'll come, and they're fantastic. But we would love to have more join. And uh, if you just need to, you just kind of need to get into physics a little more. That's a good place to come. You can leave it in the background. If you don't want to say much, you can even turn your camera off. Just have the audio on. Uh, you can get as involved as you want. I might ask you a question if I see your picture in there or your name. I might, but you know, if you don't want to answer, you don't have to answer. So, pretty relaxed attitude on a Zoom. Anywho, this is Saturday morning, and um, it happens to be 9.48, so I don't know when I will normally do the Friday Zoom. Remember, I take, I promised to Jamie, my wife, I take off Friday at noon, Friday at 12.30 p.m., up until Saturday morning sometimes, so I get out and get coffee. And then I come in and do the Friday Zoom. Just kind of on my own, but hey, if you ever, if you want to go scan it and join in on Saturday mornings, you can. All right, so I got that straightened out. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Here we go. So uh, we're looking at the uh, pack of two, class number thirteen. Packet two has turned into a mega packet. I wasn't going to do that, but because of those snow days, um, so I changed the calendar some. I've shown you that on a previous Zoom. I'll do it again on Monday. Monday is sort of the day where I'm going to try and lay out the calendar. I'm not sure the calendar every day, but show it on Mondays because I've had the weekend to kind of think about it and readjust. Okay. So, uh, I was going to try and do some kind of flashback on this on this uh, Friday Zoom, but the problem is when I do it, and I, if I just do it through Zoom, I can do that. But when I record it onto YouTube, I get copyright problems. And I, I, I think you can play a certain amount of the song, but then I don't know how you play anyway. I mean, I throw out Starburst in class. I don't know what I do for you. He did it uh, in. April and May, and there we were, we were all, we had like, you know, 40 kids in there, and we would award points, and then the winning student, which happened to be Isaac Atkins, got a, a uh, $20 gift card to Amazon. So, I don't know. Um, maybe do a Zoom edition Flashback Friday. But just, you know, we do Joe Monday, we do Flashback Friday, we, we're going to do some Eastern films and things that happen in class. That I would like the Zoom kids to have some kind of community like that. And anyway, I'm still thinking about it. I haven't forgot about you guys. I passed back the packet. Now this is a my this is my this is this is like your packet one, but I'm trying I'm making adjustments for packet two, and so some of the stuff up here wasn't really on your packet one. So um, it looks similar to your cover sheet. This is just to remind me to tell you that for the virtual kids, your packet and your notebooks are on my front porch in the handback spot. So come get them. I, I put them out there in the mornings and I take them back at night. Sometimes I don't get them at noon, but they're there every afternoon and evening, and then they come back in at night. I don't like them out there, you know, late at night. They're I mean, it's a safe neighborhood and all of this. Anyway, so point is, come by and get them, like soon, like this weekend would be nice. So you can have them to do whatever you need to. As far as those packets go, if you have a question on the score, you can email me uh, or message me on Facebook or email me through Canvas and I'll explain it to you. I uh, will say that you have up here, just to explain this to those that weren't there on Friday. Up here, um, 
I've written beside this, I've written like you might have something like um, okay. you might have something like thirteen credits, thirteen CR. That means you have thirteen credits. And so the number of credits you get translates into points. So I think on this one, the cutoff was I think ten credits gave you a 34 out of 34. Now, let me warn you, though, as I warned the class on Friday, that for packet two, for packet two, it's going to be a mega packet. I've never done a mega packet. But this thing is going to be worth a lot of points now. This is worth 116, the packet. Packet two is probably on the order of 180 or 200. Plus, you're going to have now, for the notes, uh, you're going to have 100 points, most likely. So now, I've got a 100. So, like 12 credits, I'm going to do it. But 10 credits isn't going to be enough for 100 points. So now you're going to need something like 20 credits. Probably. So some people didn't do a whole lot of notes. And you got like, over here, you got like three credits. Well, three credits translates to, I don't know, something like 18 points out of 34. But if you get like three or four credits out of 100, now you're getting, now you get 30 points out of 100, means you lose 70 points. So um, I would beef your notes up. You don't, virtual kids, you got to take notes too. Because a lot of my in class students, <clears throat> they don't take notes in class, they take notes later like from, from the screenshots or some days even, even if you take notes in class all you're doing is uh, some people are just amazing i, I see them over there just writing voraciously that's fantastic and that's really smart but some people just don't think that way they they more like write down some doodles or a couple of main words that they got out of it and then go back later from the screenshots of the Zoom and fill those in. I think that's a smart way to do it too. College is the way when I was in college that there was no kind of you had the you had the lecture and if you missed the lecture there was nothing. You had nothing, no internet backup, professor didn't have any kind of web, there wasn't any website. So you had to be there and you had to take voracious notes or you were dead because that was going to be on the test. So they had the professors had our rapt attention. <laughs> But here, you, you, you can do it in a much smarter way, and hopefully a better way. All right, so um, the point is that you do have to take notes, and you have to have a section of notes, either in your notebook or in, on written, handwritten notes, by the way. I'm not saying you can't type them up, but that's fine, too. Some students do that, um, which is cool. Uh, you just can't take copies. You can't do photocopies. I can't have photocopies of your notes. They have to be original. The notes uh, have to, last thing I'll say about this, notes have to be original. So I need the original document. Um, whoops, original, yeah, the original document. Okay, handwritten and uh, I, 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 you can type it up like on an iPad and stuff and then, and then make a PDF of that, but I don't want to. Then you can print that out and add that to your packet. That's fine too. Um, but that would be pretty obvious. I, what, what the point is, I don't want just people copying off other notes. Like I would have, like I show you example notes on Facebook for packet two, there'll be notes. And um, like I was happy uh, that Aspen agreed to be a scribe for second hour. So we'll have her notes on there too. We'll have Natalie's notes, hopefully. Hopefully Miranda comes up with some more notes for packet two. And we'll put those in the Facebook group. But you can't, you, you can hand copy. It's legal to hand copy those notes. I figure that's, you're doing studying, right? That's cool. But you can't photocopy. You can't just print it off and then just add that and say, use a mine. That's, what is that? Uh, copyright infringement. That's plagiarism. So, um, but you can, but it's, in my class, it's not plagiarism if you handwrite it. So there's a caveat. 
Well, today, on Friday, I don't get a chance to talk history much, history of physics. And um, it's become a big part of the class over the last 10 years. I have a whole history um, that we, that I, I made a decision to drop it. And so, because we were so far behind, history takes up about 10% of the class time. So that gave me about 10%. But uh, I have a whole timeline. It's like, the thing's like two or three gigabytes, it's huge, that I've built over the years. And uh, you're welcome to see it anytime. I may add it to the Facebook group just for fun. Um, but yeah, maybe I will. It takes a little bit of work, but there are those that are interested or find it interesting. To me, physics is is a bunch of numbers and equations and graphs unless you start to look at where they came from. And that's the interesting part. Uh, history of science is fascinating. It's just, it's, it's, to me, it's much more fascinating than just normal history because you understand it's really the history of thought. It's how people think and how, how thought has changed. You can kind of say well, where we're going to go in the future. You know, where are we right now? So if you don't know your history, you know, you're doomed to repeat it. And, that's, and, and I see it in science all the time. And we'll talk about that today. So I am going to do a little bit of some of the main characters like Newton or, or Einstein, maybe uh, later on second semester, or Faraday, um, <clears throat> maybe Niels Bohr. I mean, just some of the main, the main topics I'll do a little bit of history on. Uh, because it'd be a shame for you to come out of physics from high school without having, without knowing about Galileo, Emily de Chatelier, and in our um, in our feast and film, we'll do our first one right before Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll eat some food and we'll watch that. That's about Einstein, but it really goes back and picks up how he got where where his ideas came from. And so we'll look at Faraday. Uh, on that day, which is really it's an awesome story. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Galileo today mostly, and then at the end we'll do a little bit of. Um, I'll show you the homework assignment. So if you don't want to know anything about Galileo, um, there'll be a essay question probably. Yes, yeah, there'll probably be an essay question on Galileo on the take home test, which I'm going to write this weekend, and uh, probably the last one will be on a take home test, and then. Um, and that's coming out on the PDF coming out on Sunday, and then the take home test I'm going to hand out Monday. Okay, I didn't even look at the, if the copy machine works. Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, let's talk about Galileo a little bit. Pictures of Galileo, I should have added one that you normally see. If you do a Google search, hit pause and do a quick Google image search for Galileo. And most of the pictures that come up, most of the paintings that come up, he was an old man with an old white beard, right? Well, thing is, Galileo did his best work in his 20s and maybe early 30s. There's an old saying in physics that you're washed up by the time you're 30 uh, because all the great thoughts tend, tend to come from your mind when you're still young. Like, I'm 61. I'm not really, I can have creative thoughts, but as far as a paradigm shift, I struggle with that. You know, you all can, you're still young, plastic minds, you can, you can change it, you can mold it. And so most of these great thinkers, like Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton did some of his best work on optics when he was like 22, 23. Uh, Galileo did a lot of his great work when he was in his 20s and early 30s. Um, after that, he kind of, you know, he ended up under house arrest and then politics got involved and religion got involved and he got under house arrest, so he couldn't do a whole lot in his older age. But um, he was very influential when he was a young man. So Einstein's the same way. Einstein was, had these thoughts when he was young, in college and in getting a PhD um, in his 20s. Um, he continued to do great things when he was older, but 
you know, kept working on the grand unified theory, but uh, really didn't become as much of a player once quantum uh, took over. Uh, Heisenberg, as a young man, uh, did most of his best work. So you don't find a lot of old physicists that are breaking ground. Now, back in the day, back in Galileo's day, one single person could, could, could change the, the course of, of science, could change the course of history. But now it's harder to do that. Now it's like whole teams of people. And I'm not talking engineers. I mean, engineers will take that. Engineers really can, are inventors. They can be inventors, certainly. They're amazing. I don't think like an engineer. That much. I'm more of a theoretical physicist. Um, I'm not a theoretical physicist, but I think more like a. I mean, I'm a teacher, right? So I'm not really a, a true theoretical physicist, but I think on those terms. If I went and got a PhD, I mean, I have a master's, but if I got a PhD to be in some type of theoretical physics, because I think in terms of the math and the equations and the broad pictures, but I'm not a tinkerer, and that's called an empirical physicist. Galileo was more of a tinkerer, I guess, with his inclined planes. So he didn't go out and do a ton of experiments, but nobody did back then. And nobody did. Uh, physics was actually still a, there was no, there was no such thing as physics. It was natural philosophy. And so Galileo, you can consider him a philosopher. In fact, some do in some way. But he was more of a, Hard nosed, uh, I'm going to actually do an experiment. I'm going to, and then I'm going to add, I'm going to quantify it. So that's why I call, that's why I consider Galileo the first physicist. Some may go as far as far up as Newton, but I think by the time Newton came around, there was, you know, there was already plenty of uh, uh, work out there. So here's Galileo. I'm guessing at around early 30s. Um, doing his best work. Okay, so here's the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I only included it because we talked about it. We talked about Leaning Tower of Pisa on day one, and I should have, with all this COVID stuff, I was scrambling, but I should have had that image up on day one because that's what Da Vinci jumped off of. We talked about Leaning Tower of Pisa. That thing has been there. Think of that, what an amazing structure it is. You can see people up top there. Uh, you can walk up, and that's my wife and I went to uh, when we went to Italy. We I was gonna, I had certainly had plans to want to go to Pisa, but Pisa is out of the it's kind of off the beaten path, it's not that easy to get to. You can take trains everywhere in Italy, but um, I we opted not to. We stayed an extra day in Florence or something because Florence is so amazing. But from what I've heard, now don't get mad at me if you're from Pisa, but I've heard that Pisa is beautiful and all, but the main thing is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So that thing has been leaning since, well, Da Vinci was thinking he could jump off it, I guess, in 1495. So I could do a quick search, but I'll let you do it. Um, and that is find out when the Leaning Tower of Pisa was built. I should have had the students do it in class today, or Friday. Anyway, so it's been around forever. Well, that thing started leaning really quickly. And if you think about why that would be, look how beautiful it is, all this the structure. But they didn't realize they had big buildings back then, like big cathedrals. But, you know, the Parthenon, uh, even way back in Greek times, like the pyramids, for goodness sake. But this is concentrated. Um, I mean, the pyramids had an amazing geometry to them. So they, they could, they wouldn't. Like this is putting so much weight on such a small amount of ground. And this is way before you had skyscrapers. I mean, the first real skyscraper we're talking 1880s or something. So we're, about, we're talking 1400s here probably. And I, I may be totally wrong on that. Check me on that. But they just weren't the engineers of the day. I guess you call them engineers before they really did physics. But they didn't really understand that the structure needed to have a strong foundation. I mean, it had a foundation and all. And I'm sure they, uh, maybe they thought they were at bedrock, but somebody could look at the history of that, why it started leaning. That's interesting. 
Uh, anyway, so they've had to go in. This thing would have fallen over even before Galileo had thought about dropping objects off it. Uh, it would have fallen over a long time ago. And let me pause. I'm going to pause this now. I'm starting to wonder. I'm going to pause this and look up and look that up just to be sure here. Mm, how do I do this? Pause. Pause. Here we go. Pause recording. So I'll come back in a second. All right. So I'm back. I did some quick recording. Uh, I did some quick uh, looking at research on that and the Leaning Tower of Pisa, they started building it in the 12th century. Uh, and they finished building it in the 14th century. That's bizarre. So they started building it in the 1100s. And then in the 1300s, they finally finished it. Oh my goodness, they took them 200 years. They must have worked a little bit at a time. Uh, there's probably some, there was probably, it probably got started and then there was a war or two, and so they stopped, and then they came back and worked on some more, my guess. But they said it started leaning pretty quickly. About the 14th century, it started leaning, and it tilted about four degrees. Um, that tilt went to almost five, over five degrees. In 1990, they realized it was going to fall over, so they started doing some, now they had done some, some work ahead of time, but they did some real excavating and building up that foundation. And they brought the tilt back to four degrees or 3.97 degrees in the 1993s, something like that. So now it's considered stable, but they, they just didn't know back then. Okay, so I'm talking about the entire piece. It's not that important, but it's important, I guess, in the history of physics because of da Vinci, you know, starting to dream of jumping of jumping off it and um and then is that coming up you guys see that i hope you didn't see that uh i'm getting a little notification anyway so um da vinci considered jumping off it in 1495 and then galileo i uh, suggested that you drop and galileo didn't actually drop different sized objects from the entire pizza we're going to do that at Har the har later on he had he, he didn't commission them, but some of his followers did drop things later and prove that Galileo was correct. The problem is, this is about an 18-story building. So it's like, you know, 20 stories, close to 20 stories. So it's a, that's a big skyscraper. I mean, really, uh, it's the size of about, uh, it's, a, it's a little taller, I think, than uh, Starkey's uh, in Normandy. So think about that structure back then. That must have been blew everybody away. There weren't any skyscrapers. So it was it's a it was a destination. Okay. It, it or the Campanile had to be Campanile and Venice had to be the two tallest structures in Europe. This is my guess now. Now they built the Eiffel Tower in those 1800s, and that was uh, the tallest structure uh, in Europe for a long time. But um, these must have been the tallest structure. I think this is 18 story, but it seems like that's taller than the Campanile. We'll talk about the Campanile here in a minute. Okay, so I just, since we do talk about it a lot, I, for early physics, I thought we'd go ahead and show a picture of it. And then, of course, Galileo was trying to understand gravity, so he goes to his inclined plane, he dilutes gravity, he puts these bells along here. This is a later model. Um, and the bells, you know, are where the, uh, it, it kind of lets him know because he doesn't have a watch. So he can determine, he can actually measure the distance between bells or heartbeats, or he used a water clock. They invented it, him or, he wasn't like Edison where he had a whole army of people working for him. He had Salviati and Salviati was an amazing guy, but um, he had, probably put this whole thing together. So like Galileo would, I think Salviati was doing all the work, uh, but Galileo was kind of giving him instructions. And there's a book called The 10 Most Beautiful Experiments. Um, and I forget, oh, one of my favorite authors wrote that. I don't have a list of this at school, but he, in that book, it's a very small book. It's really well written. It's an easy read. You can read it one weekend, but, um, he, he has details of what Galileo told Salviati to do. I need to get pictures of that and put that in the screenshot. But uh, 
kind of looked at my photos. So anyway, so Galileo couldn't really realize that he couldn't, he's trying to understand gravity. He's trying to understand acceleration of gravity. He's trying to quantify it. So he dilutes gravity by building these inclined planes. And I'm just talking about Galileo here. So we saw, we, we do the, we're doing the trio. Now he didn't do the trio because he didn't have graphs. Uh, Descartes had not invented graphs yet. Uh, it wouldn't be, I don't think graphs would be invented for like another 40, 50 years. And don't quote me on years. I mean, it's in, the, I'm in the ballpark. You know, I'm the one figure, I'm about one or two figures, I'm okay. Anyway, so um, Galileo then got sent that box, and I hold this up in class, a box of lenses from the Danes, and he uh, puts those together convex, concave entities. Now, this is his first telescope right here. I think this is the first one. This is on display in Florence. Uh, you've got to spend a day at the Galileo Museum when you go there. Hopefully, you'll go to Florence one day. But this is the three times this is his first telescope. I believe this is like the telescopes that he was inventing were a little like the iPhones. I mean, you come out with the iPhone 6, the iPhone 7, the iPhone 8, um, and Galileo would come out. I don't know whether it was once a year or once every six months, or he would, him and Salvi Auto would get back to the glass shop and, and work and build a new one that's even better. It was all about the lenses. I mean, the tubing. Uh, this I'll show you detail. The tubing was some amazing craftsmanship because sort of like the iPhone. I mean, they knew that they were changing the world. And so when Steve Jobs came up with the iPhone, when him and you know his engineers came up with the iPhone, they knew they were changing the world. So same thing with Galileo. So they took their time to make this thing. This is also um, I don't know how many were like 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 his first version one. Did he make ten of those? Somebody could find out for me, and then I'll give you some good points for that. I, I for that kind of research, if you do something that ends up changing how I talk about it and adds to the discussion for next year, uh, then I'm going to reward you. I don't know, ten points. I don't know. It depends on how much time it took you. We'll negotiate. And then this one, this one here. Uh, the bigger one, I think this is three times, and I think I've read some books on Galileo, but it's been years. I think this was like 10 times. Um, it was better magnification. So, most of the work we go into the glass shop, uh, how to get that con, you know, how to work on the, the, the convexness of the glass. That was not easy to do, right? I mean, to make it smooth. I mean, just ask those that put the Hubble telescope together. It ain't easy to make this. That's a different kind of telescope, but it's not easy to make this um, this glass smooth and 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 at the right. And you don't if 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 it's not. I think probably the smoothness is one thing, but also the curvature. If the curvature isn't right, and I really now that I'm thinking about it, I would like to know how the heck did Salviati and Galileo make that thing? They had to have a form. They must have poured it into the glass. It has to be very transparent. And so they must have poured it into a form that was at the right shape and then uh, in the glass shop. So these are all questions that I, yes, I have read about it, but it's one of those books from years ago. And I don't remember. But if you can find that information on this and then send it to me, I will reward you. I promise you'll be my researcher. So um, let's look at this. Here's the, I think this is the original one. And like I said, it's, it's, it's like an iPhone. I mean, it's just brilliantly put together and beautifully put together. And so these guys knew that this was a big deal. It was the greatest technology of the day. This is before the microscope. Now, the microscope was the guy was Robert Hooke who kind of made it famous. But it's once again just a series of lenses. And so Hooke came along after Hooke was just before get just before Newton. He was an old he was around with Newton. In fact, him and Newton argued all the time and fought bitterly. Uh, Hooke was sort of in charge of the Royal Society of the um, instruments. So he had access to a lot of equipment and he helped develop or he used the microscope. So same idea though with reflecting and refracting.
refracting lenses and the shape and the bend and the optics. Same idea. Once again, Hooke didn't really understand the optics either. Galileo did not understand the optics of what he was doing. He, uh, it was, it took Isaac Newton to come and do that later. That's like, we're talking, what, 50, 60 years later, Newton came along, or maybe, yeah. If you go from the point at which Galileo made the telescope to the point at which Newton came up with optics when he was in his 20s, we're talking that 60 years or so. Once again, I'm in the ballpark. Okay, so see this right here, this part? This is, here, this is cool because when you, when you do a, when you break it apart, this can be adjusted. There's a concave lens and that's the eyepiece, but you have a convex lens up here. And then you have a focal length in here, but you can adjust your the focal point. You can adjust your focal length uh, by this. This is no small feat. This is amazing technology for 1604, uh, 1610 in that range. Uh, so uh, there's the eyepiece. And here's a mock-up of it. Once again, Galileo did not draw these up. He wasn't understanding the bending of light. We don't, we didn't really understand the bending of waves till we get to Snell's law. Um, and, and this is even after Newton. Snell, I'm not sure, I'll have to go back and look up when Snell was, but we study Snell's law in geophysics. But that's the uh, bending of waves uh, when they go through different mediums with different, mediums have speeds and light has different speeds. It has, Yes, the speed of light, you know, they always say, well, the speed of light is constant. And the speed of light is constant in a vacuum. It doesn't change. But when light goes through a window, it bends. And it bends, and part of it reflects, part of it bends. It depends on you know, the darkness around it, or the light around it. But light will bend through glass because it has different uh, speeds. Sound waves do the same thing. Uh, sound waves change speed depending on the thickness of what it's going through. We think of sound waves through air. Now, I don't want you to think, I don't want you to get the misconception that you can compare totally sound waves to light waves because you can't. Sound waves need a medium, light waves don't. Sound waves work on compression and refraction of air molecules or of if the sound moves through water, sound moves through rock. Sound moves through any kind of sheet rock. It doesn't matter. Sound will move through it. But, well, I mean, you can have an insulated room and sound gets absorbed. That energy gets absorbed. But what I'm saying is, in everyday life, sound moves through a medium. It has to have a medium. If you, if you take the sound away, and I used to do this little uh, demonstration for the kids where I took my two-year-old's little, little fire truck away from him. <laughs> He didn't realize it. It was in his toy drawer. Don't oh, you think I'm cool? But but it had a little remote control on it that made the little um, it made the lights go on, and then it made a siren. Woo woo! It was real loud. And so you could do the remote control, and we'd put it inside a vacuum tube, the big bell jar, and then we you could see all the kids could hear it, and then we'd vacuum out the air. Now it, this is a bell jar, wasn't perfect, but it would vacuum out like. 95% of the air. And then I would you, then I'd turn the remote control on and you could see the lights, but you couldn't hear anything. So you can't hear anything in a vacuum because you have no medium, but light's not like that. They thought light was like that. that that's why we, one of the reasons why Newton developed something called the ether, uh, which we talked about earlier this year. But, but still light waves and sound waves, waves and waves in general do share properties. And one of those is that they will bend, waves bend if they go from a, a different types of medium. So like, that's why when you look for a straw in a glass of water or a pencil and you look at it from the side, it bends. Okay, I'm getting way into optics, but I didn't want to get into it, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be talking about Galileo. All right, uh, Saturday morning philosophizing. So thing is that Galileo didn't understand all that. He, uh, because he just, he, he didn't have the uh, epiphany that, that Newton had. Newton was obsessed with light like Einstein was. Newton was obsessed with light in his 
younger days. Uh, he Newton would lay sick in bed uh, when he was a young, he was a sickly child. He had kind of a horrible childhood, to tell you the truth. Um, not a good relationship with mom. Didn't really know his dad. Dad, I think, died in. Uh, I think his dad was a farmer and died in, like, when Newton was before he was born or after he was born. I've read all these books and it's been too many years and I've had a couple of strokes and so I just I don't remember like I used to. But anyway, um, that's where you guys come in. You got to help me. So uh, Newton. Um, I'm talking too much about that. All right, I need to get back to Galileo. It's going to take forever. Anyway, the point was that Newton, as a sickly child, would lay in bed, and the light would um, go from the slits of the walls. The light would come in, and he could tell the time of day. He started figuring it out. People would come to him actually as a kid and ask him what time it was, because he would know the season and where the light was on the floor. He would follow that, and then he started seeing light bend, and he got different colors, like you do when you sometimes in your house. The light you'll see a red, and you'll see yellow, depending on if it goes through a diffraction grading or whatever. But you'll see the light. You'll see rainbows in your house. Like you can put a crystal right and hang it in your window, and you'll see all these rainbows. Which I highly suggest you do that. Um, I did when I was in high school. But anyway, so. Um, Newton saw that, and then Newton started working with optics, and I think that was his first real uh, introduction to the Royal Society was uh, him explaining optics, and that's when Hooke and him started getting to be enemies. Well, I got way off the topic there. So the point I was trying to make was that Galileo did not really understand optics. He did it by because a student asked it in class in first out. And a uh, and Galileo just he did it by trial and error, um, you know, kept working on it. Okay, and if we had five years to do physics, we'd spend a week just playing with lenses and light, and then doing the kind of making little Galileo telescopes, you know. Okay, so this is more now this these this down here. Now we're talking more of the drawings of, I don't, these are not Galileo's drawings. These are probably Newton's drawings. And you can see the way the light is bending. Once again, this is something called Snell's Law. You have incident angles. Um, every one of these, you draw a normal line, and then you have incident angles here. The light comes in, the light goes out. Uh, all this is, but that was all developed much much later. So I'm showing you this, but this don't get the misconception that this is what Galileo was thinking. This is more Newton, Snell, those kind of people uh, that are putting these diagrams together later. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to see, I'll blow this up for you, uh, to see how optics works, how light works. It's a whole fascinating field to go into. Uh, we used to do a lab with students, and then we pushed it down to the middle school. No, we pushed it down to physical science. We maybe you still do that in physical science, where you do the reflect, reflecting and refracting. So I stopped doing it since I gave it to them, but uh, hopefully you still do it down there. Okay, so let's keep going. This is Campanile, and Campanile, this is in Venice. This is a modern day. This is at St. Mark's Square in Venice. Uh, this is the Doge, if I remember my Venice. So we have the Campanile here. We have the, um, the Doge Palace, I believe. Is there St. Mark's? Uh, that's St. Mark's. Uh, there's the Doge Palace. I'm going to spell it wrong. So let's say Palace. Uh, there, if I remember my, I think I'm right on that. Yeah, anyway, these are little markets down here. This is a great place to go hang out. What? They're calling Joe Biden president now? Oh, wow. Okay. That's a big deal. Well, talk about a timestamp. <laughs> if you're watching this in the year 2030, if it still exists, this video, uh, it'd be weird. If you like watching an old video and somebody goes, oh man, uh, Richard Nixon's president. <laughs> That's great. Anyway, so here's Campanile. 
uh, this tower here. This is where Galileo, uh, Galileo hung out up here. And a side note, this um, tower fell in the, it just collapsed. I don't know whether it's an earthquake or whether there was some solid ground beneath it or something, but it collapsed in like late 1800s, early 1900s, and they had to rebuild it. They rebuilt it brick by brick. So they kept as much of the original as they could, you know, replaced in some. So it's still it's the exact same replica of what it looked like. But you can walk up these this the staircase and Jamie and I stood in line. Well, we were going to stand in line. We were, we were hot that day. And I regret, I still, I regret to this day not going up there. That was so stupid. But I was tired. And so we went to the palace instead. And the palace is amazing. Um, all right. So, him, so, so Galileo would do a lot of his, remember I said in class, well, we were in class, we were virtual, but I held up a tube and I said, Galileo, the thing he did, the genius of Galileo, is took those lenses that the Danes gave him, and he put them in a tube, and he started looking. He saw that he could, and, and looked at focal length, and, and the, it was a genius move. I would like to have been there when he figured out that they could put that convex lens in conjunction with the concave lens, and then move that around, probably just in his, in his hand, and saw what that did, and saw that he could do a focal length, and he could, he could bring things in focus, he can look far away, uh, and so then put him in a tube, which makes sense, um, and looked out uh, on the ocean from this from the Campanile. You can see you can see ships out there. Uh, remember, Venice was the um, wasn't the capital, but it was like it was the main port, one of the main ports in Europe, and uh, they had it was the first merchants go. Um, now I'm going to be wrong on my history, but there's other the Ottoman Empire. I think there's other people that brought in their goods. It wasn't the Silk Highway, but it was people brought their goods in there at the port, and so it was a very strategic and economic port. Well, there was also battle spots, so they had to protect their port uh, from I don't know marauders or pirates of the day or whatever. So. The, when Galileo showed the, um, I guess I'll say the military, but the the Navy, I hate to use these modern day terms, but I'm not an expert, obviously, but when Galileo would show them this, that got them excited because you could see a ship, this is, this is just three times, you, you could see a ship way before you could with your naked eye. So I gave them plenty of warning. So just from that point of view, I mean, yes, it's a curiosity, but it just has a militaristic defense point of view. So that was all taking place up here in the, in the Campanile. And here is the Doge. Uh, this guy here is the Doge. And then this is Galileo here. Uh, Galileo, I like, I love this picture of Galileo, this painting Galileo. It looks like a hipster, right? Like he probably owned his own brewery. Um, and Galileo, this is where Galileo warned, Galileo was became famous uh, as much as you could back in the day. This is, um, I guess, the Gutenberg Press. I guess they had they had press, so I suppose they, they had books. Um, so anyway, and by the way, I was telling uh, I think second or third hour of this today that. There are, you can actually hold books that Galileo used, and Galileo actually wrote in the margins. And you don't have to go to the Vatican or to Venice to do this. You can do it at OU in the Bazell Library. Terry Magruder, Dr. Magruder, is a treasure for Oklahoma, and he runs that. Uh, and they had the big Galileo exhibit a couple, a few years ago. Uh, but we have a lot of Galileo uh, uh, material. If you go to the fifth floor, you, have probably, you can't just walk in uh, because this is a $35 million collection um, of books and paintings and things like that. But OU, it was a huge donation. So OU has books on uh, Galileo with, with Galileo's handwritten notes. He has, there's books on Isaac Newton. Uh, with Isaac Newton's hands, you can actually with gloves on, 
you can go back in the vault and hold and carry if there's somebody with you there. Uh, they'll let you hold it and actually look through the book. It's amazing. I don't know if they still do that. This was 20 years ago or 10 years ago, whenever it was that I was up there. But, um, but so Galileo did have, so there were, there were books uh, about him and by him, uh, not like novels, but like, like back in Copernicus day, it was pamphlets they would put out. But by the time, that was 1543, by the time Galileo, 50, 60 years later, uh, there was more of a press. Mostly that was for Bibles and, you know, Latin and things like that. But Galileo was, fit, was fluent in Latin. Anybody that was educated understood Latin back then. So Galileo would write in Latin, uh, as would Newton. Um, in Nullius, uh, Nullius in Verbo, which was the, uh, it was the uh, motto for the Royal Society, is Latin. That means not by word of mouth. Um, so there was a lot of Latin phrases. We'll get to one here in a minute. Anyway, um, this is the, uh, there's Galileo. Uh, Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. Uh, there's the Doge. I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a chance here. Oh man, I'm gonna blow this. I'm gonna blow it. Doge. That sounds wrong. Okay, I gotta pause this. Let me pause for a second. Okay, I take it back. I was right. So that's how you. That is how you spell it. So this is. I'm thinking this has to be the Doge, and once again. My memory is suspect these days, but he was the man in charge, obviously, right? So uh, Galileo is showing him this. This is up. This happened in the Campanile. So Galileo is. You can see it's Venice over here, right? Uh, obviously. So Galileo is showing him the telescope and showing him the like a magical tube, like I say, with the iPhone today. So uh, that he gets this is his source of funding. I mean, you want to not only that, you want political cover. So when somebody can do this, when they know they got a genius amongst them, and by all intents and purposes, Galileo was a genius. Uh, he was a egotistical, but I suppose narcissistic. I don't want to say that. I don't know. That. I don't know that for sure. I know. I know. I know Newton was, um, but. But you don't mess with these people if you have them in your like, like right now, like Steve Jobs. He became they did mess with Steve Jobs plenty, but um, somebody like Elon Musk, Elon Musk is more of a businessman, but <clears throat> also, I don't know if you put him in the genius realm, he's, he is a physics major, by the way. Um, but he's uh, you don't you don't mess with Elon Musk, or they do, but they don't really <laughs> because we need people like that, and so. Galileo was sort of a uh, job, Elon Musk. Um, um, yeah, those are mostly, I wouldn't say either one of those are scientists. Uh, he's, if you want to throw in Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, and um, <clears throat> uh, um, Sean Carroll or something, a, a real, a really research person um, that of his day. Okay, so. He had political cover, but he also needed funding, and he had funding to build these better and better telescopes. Because it's almost like a now we have a space race with Russia. Uh, I don't know what other countries, something else you can look up. What other, I mean, Italy then had the telescope because they had Galileo. When did England start using the telescope? When did, you know, when did Germany start using the telescope? Those kind of questions. Okay, so here he is, the famous painting. I'd love to have this painting. A famous or even a mock up of it, not the painting, obviously, but a mock up of it. Here is uh, Galileo showing Doge, and so boom, he's got, he's a, he's a made man at that point. Uh, and like I said, he went to a better one at 10 times. He ended up going up, somebody asked in class, how good did his telescopes get? And I think he reached the limit of, I think he did a 32, around a 30 times telescope. But what happens is you get aberrations around the boundaries of it. And those that it's because of the, the way the light bends, you get these aberrations and it starts to make the whole picture 
hard to see. So when you get to around 30 times with a Galileo telescope, you've reached your limit. And so Newton realized this, and he developed the reflecting uh, telescope uh, about 50, 60 years later. I mean, Newton was an inventor. I mean, you know, Newton did so much, but he, he was partly empirical, partly theoretical. Um, but that you could do, I think, a hundred times. Um, once again, I'm reaching my limit. We've got to talk to Pentecost about that, but um, yeah. So anyway, Galileo is, these are his drawings of the moon. And that was his, he's a scientist, right? I mean, he has a curiosity. So no one, the moon was just this light in the sky. And many people thought the moon put out their own, put its own light, which is insanity. But uh, Galileo looked at the moon and did these drawings. These are actual Galileo's drawings. He was amazing. I mean, the thing is, when he's looking at this, people think, oh, well, Galileo just looked, he just looked, you know, through his, through his telescope and boom, there's what he saw. No, uh, the telescope, I thought that too. But when I read about it, the telescope, he could only see a small amount. So you have to keep moving around that and then kind of do a mosaic. So this took, he would be up there on the Campanile all night looking up there at, and finally piece it all together on these drawings. Um, so, oh, because um, why would the church not like this? We had this long discussion in class. And it turns out that the church just really pissed them off. I think Galileo was kind of innocent in a way, he wasn't, he, he was just like, man, this is amazing. You guys have got to uh, see this stuff. And in fact, I'll show you a painting in a minute where he tried to show them. But this is goes against church dogma because the idea is that heaven is perfect. Here on earth, we are all in this cesspool of sin. So since Adam, right? since the mankind has fallen. And so the earth is full of sin, original, since original sin. And we that separates us from God, right? God is perfect. God can't really be with I'm just, I'm just giving you the church God and I just saw an answer today. God can't be with us. He wants to be a friend, but he can't be with us because he's perfect and we are imperfect. So he sent Jesus, this is the Christian view. He sent Jesus to act, to get a little his liaison. Jesus was part man, part divinity, right? The Holy Spirit and all this trinity going on. So um, Jesus was God in, in person, if you, if you, you know, buy into that from the church. Well, the point is that there's this huge separation between heaven and, uh, let me turn this off. today uh, make sure that you uh, make sure that you do it socially distance <laughs> don't get too crazy if you're a, if you're a Biden if you're if you're a Trumper I'm sorry it was a rough it was a good fight um, and we need to come together now so so please don't burn down buildings but anyway so uh, yeah back to this so the church, the dogma was that that heaven was perfect and and but then why would this piss the church off well they had the view that hell was below us in the earth i mean the idea of satan satan was just a character that somebody came up with i mean there's satan's in the bible i'll give you that i'm not i'm not arguing that but giving satan a, a physical somebody just drew it up um, but this idea of evil that was like on earth or and then the idea of hell being in earth that's whole that's kind of man thought through that together to get to give us a visual but then the visual was that heaven was in the sky right somewhere up there you point to heaven well that's giving a spiritual world a physical location which is bizarre it's not physical world spiritual worlds don't have physical locations but anywho so it just makes it, it gives us a primer like we're elementary kids or something, elementary school. 
So something you can, so much, so much of humans thoughts on religion come from when they were in kindergarten or when they were in preschool and they've held on to those. It's just a sense of comfort. So this comfort was destroyed by Galileo because in heaven, the moon is a perfect orb. Right? It's a perfect circle. We know now they aren't, but the sun, which they said went across the sky because the Old Testament talked about the sun being stopped in the sky, right? So obviously the sun goes across the sky. The Venus, of course, they didn't understand planets that well back then, but uh, Mars, they thought the Mars went backwards. This, that's Ptolemy, those guys, epicycles. But all those are perfect, okay? I don't know if you can see me, but I'm waving my arms. All those were perfect. Um, but now it had to be because it's when we die and in our life, maybe you consider your life miserable, but, but back in the day, talk about misery for the masses. I mean, who was it that said religion is the opiate of the masses? Karl Marx or somebody later on, but it is. Religion is the opiate of the masses. Now it's like TV and social media and all that. But uh, back then it was religion. And you don't mess with people's religion. You don't question their faith. Um, so in a sense, Galileo is innocently questioning the faith of all this dogma, of all this religion. Because he's showing that the moon is not perfect. His mountains on the moon. And you all these pockmarks on the moon, like moon's got acne. Why would God put pockmarks all over the moon? You know, I mean, why would, if this is supposed to be a perfect, like a lot of them thought that the moon was its own light. If it's supposed to be perfect, why would God make it imperfect? So Newton got in some hot water with this one. He could have got away with that. There's later on that he started messing with Jupiter and its moons. That's when he got in real trouble. But, um, so here's, here's one of my last, I'm sorry, I'm taking so long, but here's one of the last paintings I'll show you. And then I'll quickly show you the, the homework and then we'll be done. But here's Galileo showing the church. Uh, now this is a cardinal, it's not, Pope Urban I believe was the guy back then if I remember my reading, but this guy uh, was a cardinal. Um, I guess I have a Catholic student one year and he said, well, that looks like a cardinal's uniform. So he's a cardinal, I'll take his word for it. And this is maybe a, a lower person in the church. And he's looking through this telescope, looking at the moon. And I think this is a 10 times telescope. And uh, Galileo is showing the cardinal who was in charge of his district there, showing him some of this drawings, what he's seeing on the moon. And he said, if you don't believe me, you can just look for yourself. And this guy, see the way his frown is. He's saying, there's no way. I'm not going to look through that tube because the devil uh, will cloud my vision. The devil will make me see what you want me to see, but it's not real. So it's like, I'm not going to believe my lying eyes. I'm going to believe dogma. And like this would never happen today, right? I mean, we would never have people that in the day, all this science we know now, that would just bury their head in the sand and just refuse to look at the science. Like there wouldn't be a, you know, a Senator from Oklahoma that would uh, do that. <clears throat> okay, or a president uh, or an entire um, political affiliation uh, that would just refuse. So sorry, but I'm just saying what I'm, my point is that history repeats itself. Um, and uh, favorite, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons, uh, this is 1610. Uh, Galileo discusses his discoveries with the church. Here's Galileo getting all excited. And it, this, this cardinal's saying, this is actually the Pope, I guess, and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to bam you over the head with that because don't mess with the church. All right, the last thing is uh, for Galileo is this E. Percy move. Uh, I talked to you about the, um, and I showed the kids the pendulum in class, and I talked about that famous chandelier in Italy. This is when Galileo was a teenager, and Galileo watched that pendulum in the morning swing back and forth, and then in the in one direction, and he uses pulse and said, you know, that could be a great, it, 
that's considered simple harmonic motion. And that would make a great clock. And he didn't actually invent it. Uh, I think Christian Huygens and, and then uh, Galileo's son uh, had a, a role in, in uh, designing the first pendulum clock. Um, but Galileo had the idea because he said, this is very rhythmic. But that's, that's, a, that's, 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 that's a very good inventor and that's a smart person right there. But the genius of Galileo is that in the morning that clock was going back and I mean, sorry, that pendulum, that chandelier was going back and forth in one direction. And then when he got there in the afternoon, for the afternoon, listening to all the, you know, the uh, Latin, which probably bored him to death, uh, it went back and forth in the other direction, in another, in a slightly different angle, so that he could not understand why that would happen. It wasn't because there was a different breeze in the church. It wasn't because somebody rotated the chandelier. Uh, he finally realized, and he was thinking maybe, I'm guessing, that somebody must have rotated that at first. And then he realized, wait a minute, you can't rotate. There's no way you can rotate the ceiling. He said, the only way that makes sense is if the earth rotated beneath it. And so he, as a teenager, or early young man, I'm saying teenager, as a young man, he then deduced, this is genius, right? He deduced that the earth rotates. And so if the earth rotates, it means the sun doesn't. And so the earth, the sun stays in place and the earth rotates. And that, that he held that deep in his heart as a young man. So later on in life, when he got finally, we'll get to his more, we'll, we'll get to more of Galileo later, but later on in life, he, um, when he was brought before, they, the church finally got tired of Galileo, pushed it too far, okay? And all his trips to Rome, he, he was friends with the Pope, but he finally pushed it too far. And they finally had to uh, have a trial during the Inquisition, right? Um, it's, it's like the empire strikes back. I mean, the church struck back. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, the Doge Palace, I, I mentioned Doge Palace in Venice. My wife went in, and I went in there. There's like two or three basements and that's where all the torture chambers were. They'd put you on a rack. <clears throat> You'd see the instruments but they'd rip your fingernails out if you did not believe, right? That's one way of getting people to become religious, right? Um, that's why America has freedom of religion, much to uh, the dismay of certain people. You really can, uh, you really can have your own faith in America as long as you don't hurt somebody else. So anyway, um, so Galileo then noticed that that pendulum's going back and forth the other way, and from there, so so in his trial, they forced Galileo because they said, look, if you don't. If you don't uh, recant all this, you talk about the earth not being the center of God's creation. If you don't recant that, uh, we're going to burn you at the stake like we did Bruno. They burned Bruno at the stake in 1600. And we talked about Bruno before. And if you want to look up a fascinating character, I think Bruno, this sounds crazy, but I think Bruno is evidence of alien visitation <laughs> because he knew more about other galaxies, other stars, and other planets than any human should have known. And here's the thing is, he had no evidence. He was not a scientist. Uh, in Bruno's day, there wasn't a telescope, but he had this vision. Uh, he was uh, some kind of mystic, but he was leading a movement against the church, a revolution, and they threw him in prison for it. They put him in solitary confinement, and I'm thinking they tortured him, but I'm not sure. But they put him in solitary confinement, and all he had to do was recant and say, look, Bruno, just, just say the earth is the center of, the, of God's universe and we'll let you go. He wouldn't do it. So he was so convicted. How can you be, unless he was just straight up delusional, how can you be so convicted unless you have in your heart somehow you you're, know you're right? So anyway. He was burned at the stake because he would not, even though they lit the fire, they said, okay, Bruno, last chance, recant. We, we don't want to burn you. We like you, Bruno. You're a cool guy, man. You're gentle. You're a cool soul. But we're still going to burn you alive if you don't 
believe in our dogma or you, or you, or you stop that they don't want a revolution, right? They had to, they had to control the people. And so Bruno was their example. And so they're showing the guy telling, telling Galileo 50 years later, so Galileo, we're going to burn you like we did Bruno. Uh, and so Galileo did say at the, it, he had to recant. He finally recanted at the trial. It's called, there's a famous painting, look it up, uh, image, Google search it. And I have it hanging in my room, actually. It's, it's on my wall. It's called The Trial of Galileo. Um, look it up. But Galileo had to recant. And so, but as he took his seat, now he had his, Galileo had his groupies. And as he took his seat, he muttered under his breath, e per si muov. And I think, I think there's a, somebody, somebody that does Latin all the time say, oh, you got a mistake on that. And so there's a slight Latin error here. So I apologize to all you Latin people. Uh, Margarita uh, made this, not her fault. I think I, I think I looked it up. Uh, people have this tattooed on them, actually. E. Percy Mua was tattooed on people. Um, and so he said E. Percy Mua, well, his followers wrote that down. And Galileo eventually died. He was under house arrest. He died of old age, basically. But because um, they couldn't kill him. You can't kill a legend like that. You'd have riots. So they just put him under house arrest. They controlled him, right? Like Nelson Mandela in, in you know, South Africa. You can't kill the guy. You just got to put him in prison. Okay, so um, his, the, this became a rallying cry for his people. Um, they used to, well, I'll show you what they used to. They, they actually dug up Galileo's finger, his middle finger, that is. And they put it, they, they put it on a stick and they would carry around with them. They would yell in the streets, e per si move, uh, sort of like we do today, Black Lives Matter, right? It's a movement. Um, and there the movement was e per si move, which says, and still, and still it moves, and still it moves, meaning the earth does really rotate. I, I had to recant, but I'm not really, but I do believe it in my, that and still it moves. So e per si move is a cool thing to, uh, to uh, tattoo, you wanna get a tattoo? There's a good one. Okay, so that's it for Galileo for today. Uh, I know I went way over the homework. There's what we did, first hour, second hour, third hour, we did these in class and virtual. We talked, yes, last time we talked about the seat. Look, it's a good talk last time. It's not as long as this. It's not, his, it's not historical. Uh, but we talked about sequence and tangents. Uh, we talked about positives, first order, second order, third order. Um, and then we said at the midtime, all these things are true. So the homework today is to, it's pretty simple. It's just, this is on two, sheet 2.7. The homework is to make a stegosaurus tail. So pick, so go for, do a, do a minute, a second for each one. So like between five and six, you'd come across, your base would be one second. What we're finding is secants, they're called secant slopes. And so we are finding these secant slopes and we're doing kind of what more like what Newton was doing, not really Galileo, because Galileo didn't have a, Galileo, like I said, he had two disadvantage, two major disadvantages. Um, he wasn't as smart as Newton, but, but he didn't have a, he was a different kind of thinker. He was more, Galileo was more of a, political smart person, very smart politically, but not as smart. I mean, they said that, that uh, Newton had Asperger's. Uh, they don't really give that it. So he was a, he probably did because he didn't, he would, didn't understand people very well. He wasn't a people person <laughs> to say the least, but Galileo was anyway. So they're different, they're different forces of humans anyway. So Newton had the benefit of the uh, Descartes and his uh, Cartesian coordinates. And he also had the benefit of algebra, more algebra. Galileo was more geometry. Newton was geometry too, but the Persians invented algebra. And so uh, Newton had, a, had algebra to, to thank for a lot of his thoughts too. Um, he invented calculus, but calculus is like 90% algebra and 10% magic. I always say, we'll get to that more later. So this is, these are one second intervals. And what you gotta do is, is make your right triangles. So you count these, each one of these little blocks is one meter. And so like this would be one, two, three, I'm gonna say four, if you add that up. 
about two ciggies. Let's go two ciggies there. So 4.0 meters. And then this slope is the velocity. So this V here, it's V bar. Uh, it would be simple. We could divide by one. So it's four meters per second. So I want you to do this all up this. Do color pencil. You gotta use color pencil. Okay, you have one at home somewhere. You can do a pen if you're confident. But you do this, you, you draw these and you do your numbers, okay, color them in all the way up this triangle. And probably in the in the screenshots later, you'll probably see a, I'll put a screenshot of it. And then you take these and you put these numbers down into this uh, chart. Now we're not going to do this graph down here. We're not going to do this graph yet. You just take these numbers like this one we said was was 4.0, uh, I guess. So 4.0 between five and six, the velocity we're saying is 4.0, and these are the units right there, meters per second, the second slope is the average velocity for that, for that interval. And so do this all up, the, all up the curve. It'll take you about 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe at the most, and then stop. Write your numbers over here, and then over, sorry, over here, and then stop. And that's your homework, okay? Uh, I've got a lot of homework myself. I've got to get those tests finished grading. I've got to get their test scores in. I've got to write the take-home test. Um, I've got to work on those grading, those other two assignments you've turned in. So I got some work ahead of me too. Okay, uh, I'm done. So I will, uh, sorry, I finally finished. This is the longest one I've ever done.